Welcome back to Africa Science Focus, a science and development show from SciDevNet. I am Ogichi Ekeanyo. In this episode, our reporter Michael Kaloki explores language and math education in multilingual classrooms. He speaks to Professor Jill Adler, who received the National Research Foundation's Lifetime Achiever Award. Her work is centered on showing the importance of considering the language needs of students when teaching mathematics. Professor Adler is passionate about mathematics education and has helped develop teaching strategies for multilingual mathematics classrooms. English, the colonial language, has been used in South African schools since the British colonial era and has disadvantaged students who are not fluent in it, making it difficult for them to learn mathematics and access mathematical knowledge. Professor Adler has advocated for multilingual mathematics teaching to benefit learners. We're going over to Michael to find out more. I'll be speaking to Professor Jill Adler. Professor Adler is a professor of mathematics education at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Professor Adler is speaking to me from South Africa. Jill, part of your work has focused on the teaching and learning of mathematics, particularly in multilingual classrooms. Could you tell me a little bit more? Thank you, Michael. I'm Jill Adler. So I began my research career in the mid-1990s. And um, at that time in mathematics education, as I think in education in other subjects as well, there was a real push for more active and communicative classrooms. And in all the research that I was reading from, uh, particularly from the developed world, but nevertheless in uh, the dominant research, let's call that, there was no attention given to the fact that for many, many millions of children all over the world and teachers teaching them, they were not learning mathematics in their main language or their mother tongue. And for me, there was ignorance of this um, crucial issue. I was working at a secondary level and in many post-colonial contexts at a secondary level, the mathematics teaching, as is the teaching of other subjects, are typically happening in the I don't know what you would call it. In many ways, it would be the colonial language, like in South Africa, it's English. Um, and there is an assumption that by the time the students, the, the learners get to the secondary school, they are fluent enough in uh, the language of instruction to be able to, talk, to be taught mathematics in it. But this is not trivial. And so what I wanted to do was to find out what it meant for teachers who were teaching students whose main language was not the language of instruction and they were teaching a subject like mathematics which has a very distinct what we would call register it has a very distinct way of using words and arguing so a very distinct way most sub most subjects have it they have their own what we would call lexicon they have their own vocabulary and in mathematics it's extensive and then ways of talking mathematically there was a lot of research on this but not enough on what this meant then across different languages. So I uh, studied uh, six teachers in three different what I called multilingual contexts. So the first were in South African townships where the dominant language, the majority language was not English for either the teachers or the students, and they were nevertheless teaching in English. And then in other schools where there were the classes were mixed. So some of the students in the class would be learning in English and also in the early 1990s, it was very early in post-apartheid days. And so schools had recently derationalized and teachers in schools that were homogeneously English speaking were suddenly multilingual. And I learned a great deal from working with the teachers. And what I learned in particular was how complex the task was when they were trying to teach mathematics and mathematics in English at the same time as the students were learning English and learning mathematics. And so they faced a number of challenges, whether they and how they should use their own language, I call these dilemmas. Most of the teachers who were able to switch between languages did so, and to the advantage of their teaching and the students' learning. They also had to struggle between how to use everyday metaphors and link that to the mathematics scientific register and they also struggled with how to encourage students to talk more in class when they weren't fluent 
in the language of instruction and they were expected to talk in English. And so teachers manage these tensions in different ways and with different levels of success. And some of the conclusions from that was that teachers needed to be aware of these. And in particular, where teachers themselves could work, could themselves speak multiple languages, and many South African teachers can, it was important that they did so, that they communicated in um, multiple languages where they could and allowed their students to in in those days, it was called code switching. Today, it's more referred to as translanguaging, which is a bit more fluid to understand that students don't come to school without linguistic resources. They come with extensive linguistic resources. These might not be the language of instruction, but they can speak. And sometimes, depending on the situation they're coming from, read and write in another language. They are linguistically resourced. So those resources must be used to enable them to learn. So that was the major learning from that study and how important it was also that students not only learn to talk about mathematics in what we would call colloquial or everyday terms, but they actually learned how to speak in the mathematics register to be able to use mathematical words with meaning and to use them appropriately and correctly. And that's now internationally a well-accepted situation. And in fact, the research that was done then was seminal and it inf impacted the international terrain. So as I said, I focused at the secondary. It's very different at a primary level where the students are needing to learn language, learn language, never you know, whichever language it is, as well as learn mathematics, and it's much more complicated affair in the early years. Um, just currently, internationally, the idea of what's called language responsive teaching has taken root because there's been so much migration across the world. And in many countries, there are multilingual classrooms and students who are not fluent in the language of instruction, there's multiple evidence um, um, extensive evidence that they don't perform as well as those that are that do speak the mother tongue as, uh, that do speak the language of instruction as their mother tongue, and so you need language teaching strategies in the maths classroom that help multilingual learners. This is not just a function of post-colonial contexts; it's everywhere. Post-colonial contexts have particular kinds of issues with this. I mean, those are those are more political about the status of the languages. Just a word then at the difference on the difference between primary and secondary. In the early grades, when students are learning uh, concepts initially for the first time, there is so much research that says it's important that this has happens in their mother tongue. And this is a significant challenge in uh, many countries, in particular post-colonial countries where uh, the language registers were not developed in the in the um native language, if we want to call it that. And in South Africa, we have a particular problem because there are now you know, officially recognized 11 languages. And um, it was uh, by the apartheid design that these languages didn't develop themselves and so don't have um, extensive uh, mathematics registers. And so it's quite difficult to teach mathematics in the mother tongue. Um, the issues are different. In the, in the early grades. So I think it's very important when we think about this problem that we don't think about it just homogeneously as this is all of schooling, but that we distinguish between early learning of mathematical ideas and concepts and then later learning. Uh, my colleagues in Malawi have just completed an interesting study and written a report about the learning of the concept of zero, for example. In Chichewa, there isn't a word for zero. That the words that are used for zero are like nothing and empty, um, which don't convey the numerical idea of zero. And so working across languages becomes complex, and teachers need to understand the constraints of that. And that's why it's important that teachers are empowered to understand how their languages work and how it works when they're working across languages. As an expert in mathematics education, Professor Adler worked for mathematics to be more accessible to South African students. 
This work has had profound effects on mathematics teaching and research communities. To find out more about these impacts, we're going back to Michael. I'll be speaking to Dr. James Mehring. Dr. Mehring is a director at the National Research Foundation in South Africa. Dr. Mehring, what impact has Professor Jill Adler's work had on the research community as well as the wider society? Professor Jill Atlas' work is, 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 is quite has a profound impact in, in the research community in South Africa. As we know, she's, a, she's an expert in educational uh, mathematics. A work that has helped in improving maths education in South Africa and pre-democracy 1994. She, she helped and she's a, she's, a, she's, a, she's a front runner of disrupting that because we, need, we had to understand the uh, the apartheid government's um, education system where some of our community members did not uh, get um, the adequate um, education level as some other members of the society. And Prof. Jill's Atlas work he helped in setting up that and to, to disrupt that so that all communities and specifically math uh, mathematics education in classroom, uh, speci specifically in the disadvantaged uh, areas, could improve and she was kind of uh, she's very instrumental in seeing to that uh, mathematical education even in multilingual uh, uh, setup in secondary schools improved drastically so that at least of our disadvantaged communities can improve in their mathematical skills. Dr. Mering, how significant is research in mathematics education and other areas of education? The significance in research math uh, math uh, mathematics education is very important, and uh, especially uh, looking at even Dr. Professor Jill's Atlas work is that improving maths education in a in 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 the classroom we have to then uh, foster a love for uh, mathematics. We need to understand that uh, improving your mathematical skills are upskilling you as as an individual. And that helps, you know, to upskill you for the workforce where you can apply that uh, the, the, the skills that you get from mathematics. And therefore, it translates into that a person can uh, expand into other areas of, of the research environment and apply these mathematical principles that they got through ma uh, mathematics and uh, thereby help with a knowledge economy, helping creating an innovation of new in, in research and for new products which our country uh, die uh, and specifically need. The National Research Foundation Award recognizes individuals who have made extraordinary contributions to the development of science in South Africa. And this award recognizes Professor Adler's contributions to advancing mathematics teaching and research. Professor Adler told us what it means to her. It was an immense honor to receive this award. Uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award is probably what, I, you know, the, the kind of the pinnacle award you could receive in your career that says over a lifetime you've made a significant contribution and what more acknowledgement would anybody want than that? And I felt completely humbled by the award. Um, but for me, the importance wasn't only personal. The award... Um, the Lifetime Achievement Award, I think it's the first time it's been given to an educationist. And for me, that was very significant because educational research is often not acknowledged as important in the policy arena. And this award and the work that I've done, so much of the work that I've done has been located in the real conditions of our classrooms. And what I mean by that is classrooms where there are limited resources, classrooms where teachers are managing multilingual students, classrooms where teachers are managing children that are coming from contexts of poverty. All these teaching conditions are not trivial, they're not easy, and it's not the same as when you're working in a middle-class context. And so for me that the award was given in acknowledgement of the research and the significance of the research, because it's a research award, um, the significance of the research that was done out of those contexts and that that research was not only meaningful but impactful both locally and internationally 
was incredibly important. I think it provides a message that educational research that is grounded in local conditions is very important um, and important, therefore, for future policy and so on. Jill, South Africa's National Research Foundation awarded you for advancing maths teaching, research and empowering maths educators in South Africa. What role do you feel empowering educators has on society? You know, there's um, a lot of evidence that the the relationship between educational outcomes and po- and poverty are are well known. That in in areas of poverty, educational outcomes are low. Um, so the economic conditions in which people are working are are crucial. And what is further to that work is that in those conditions, the quality of teaching matters extensively. In contexts of poverty, children don't have what's called the second site of learning in the home. Uh, For various reasons, parents are often at work all the time. They're not supported in the way middle-class children are are supported. And so the quality of teaching in contexts of poverty makes an immense difference. And supporting teachers and empowering teachers in those contexts is therefore critical. One of the things... um, that I always get um, distressed about is when there are proclamations about teachers in general and teachers are described as being the problem. So we get poor results and all teachers are blamed for this. This is not a way to support teachers and to understand that teachers who are working in um Conditions of poverty have real constraints on their hands and supporting them to do that work is the way to go rather than always um, putting out that they're the problem. So I think that comments on quality teaching and what this means needs to be differentiated, not just blanket claims about teaching in general, but where are they teaching and what are they teaching for and what the quality is. And we need to inspire teachers. Teachers who are inspired will inspire their learners. And teachers who are motivated to teach will motivate their students to learn. Teachers who are demoralized cannot do that. And so it's very important that through professional development programs and through public discourse that teachers are supported to do their work. They are crucial to the development of any society. Professor Adler's work has impacted many educators and researchers. Michael spoke to one of these scientists who works as a mathematics educator and researcher. My name is Monewang Leshoda. I am a man, the manager and senior researcher at the University of Pretoria in the unit of Pre-University Academy. Dr. Leshota, you have a passion for research specifically pertaining to professional development of mathematics teachers. What would you say are some key elements of significance you have uncovered from your research? When we do research, a lot of times we forget the development work. And so one of the things with professional development that has been very significant for me is to realize that teaching without any underlying theory is really like teaching without a purpose. And so part of the research that I'm working on, which is on textbooks basically, and the use of textbooks, which is basically one of the major resources that are used by teachers in the classroom anyway, is really saying if we teach And if we use that textbook without understanding what is there in the textbook and what I'm going to be doing with this textbook and what I want to achieve, then it it is not um, going to work. So my research really has uncovered that in terms of what the teachers are doing in the classroom, there's always decision-making that's being done by the teachers. Sometimes it comes in through the lesson planning that they have done. 
But on the moment, decision making, it's so important because it is based on what is happening right there in the classroom. And the teacher needs to have the tools ready to make very important decisions at the moment. Thank you, Dr. Leshota. What influence has Professor Adler had on your career? And can you share moments or experiences with Professor Adler that left a lasting impression and informed some of your academic career decisions? Professor Adler, I met her at an international conference in Mexico. At that time, I was trying to find my way in mathematics education because of the bridging program and also because I was teaching first year mathematics at that time where I was finding quite lots of problems that we, we talk about in, in the mathematics world of students that are not really coping well with their mathematics when they get to their first year at university. So I went to this conference and I met this Professor Etla, who I didn't know at all. But I liked her, the way she approached me, and I went to look for her when I went back home, and I found that she was a professor in mathematics education. I had been looking for somebody that, someone that I could work with in mathematics education instead of pure mathematics. So I would get professors in pure mathematics or applied math who had um, interest in education. But I hadn't met people who actually in the region here in South Africa who were in mathematics education, and that is Professor Etla that I met. And then I asked her to be my supervisor. She accepted. When I, w I came to her, I knew mathematics. I didn't know much about mathematics education. I didn't know the theories. I didn't know, you know, the, the, the technical language that is taught in mathematics education. I didn't know. But basically what I can say is that Professor Ekla took me by the hand and guided me through what I saw as a maze of all sorts of things which I didn't know what, what was happening with at that PhD level for, for that matter. The theories of mathematics education, the theories in education, and everything that I needed to, to, to learn. After the five years that I was with her, working with her in research, but also in professional development program, I went into the school. For the first time, I went in and sat into the classrooms where I saw teachers working, where I saw learners, and understood for the first time what those interactions and what was needed to learn and to teach effectively. I think in a nutshell, this is what Professor Etla got me so that by the time I finished my PhD, I knew that I didn't really just want a job that gets me into a classroom at university and back in my office for research. I wanted something that had development in it. And for me, development was professional development of mathematics teachers. We have a history in South Africa of mathematics teaching, and I wanted to be part of that, of making a change like she, she did and she's continuing to do right now. Mathematics education is important because it's the foundation for many other subjects such as science and engineering. It is also important for everyday life. Professor Jill tells us why it is important to ensure that students are equipped to learn mathematics. I don't know that the the outcomes in South Africa are necessarily mirrored everywhere else on the continent. But uh, in the post-apartheid era, we have uh, had to face the fact that, that outcomes in mathematics are very poor. And the way the curve works is that there are too many, the, the performance curve is that uh, loads of students are failing or getting very low results, and very few students are getting um, good results in mathematics if you're thinking about the, the grade 12 level. That's a significant problem in any society. 
because uh, success in mathematics at school is about the pipeline into the university and therefore into tertiary studies and tertiary studies in science and tertiary studies in all the science and engineering related subjects, anything to do with STEM depends on mathematical uh, mathematical achievement. And, and I don't just mean it. When I say mathematical achievement, I don't just mean getting good grades. I mean coming out of grade 12 mathematics with a good sense of what the subject is and a positive feeling and positive attitudes towards the subject and feeling empowered to do and to enable others to do the subject. Um, so when I embarked on my, uh, I had a specific, chair in mathematics education called the South African Search Initiative Chair from 2010 to 2019, and I was working with schools in in the Gauteng province. Our goal was to change the performance curve, that we needed to have less students failing and more students doing better, Um, because it's absolutely crucial that the pipeline for mathematics is strong through through the school. Our pipeline is very weak. Now, this is an international problem, actually, that the pipeline of mathematics, so so students do relatively well in mathematics, but then as it progresses up into grade 12, um, people people leave doing mathematics. Uh, So they've called this the, the sort of leakage in the pipeline. And in many other countries, they've been working on how to strengthen the pipeline between the secondary school and the university. The problem in a country like South Africa is the pipeline leaks from the first grade. We have massive problems and they increase in the secondary school. So it's really important that more and more students are successful and feel successful in mathematics because without that, we can't develop science in the society. And while it's not the only thing that develops the economy, it's absolutely crucial. It's absolutely crucial that there are more people coming and able to enter the sciences, not only the mathematical sciences, but all the sciences, many of which depend on uh, mathematical skills. In fact, it's becoming more and more understood that um, biology and developments in biology now have mathematical entailments, economics, study of economics is, is dependent on understanding proportionality in mathematics, It's not only pure mathematics that needs students in mathematics going further, but many, many of the professions and things that are at work to strengthen an economy. When it comes to schooling more generally, then I think that we we have to understand the relationship between socioeconomic conditions and uh, school attainment. The, The... biggest impact on impact factor in improving school attainment is changing socioeconomic conditions. So the equation is really, or inequality if you like, is that improving socioeconomic conditions is what will lead to improving school attainment. It's very difficult for changing school attainment in the hope that it will change socioeconomic conditions. It's rather the other way around. And that, that research is, comes through internationally. So in very short terms, you can try to improve education, but if you don't change people's socioeconomic conditions simultaneously, school performance or school attainment is unlikely to improve. That's all from us at Africa Science Focus today. If you want to find out more, head to the SciDevNet website. That's www.scidev.net. Today's show was produced by Alice Hurst with editing and hosting by me, Ogechi Ekeanyao, and reporting by Michael Koloki. Until next time, goodbye. African Science Focus is produced by SideFNet and distributed in association with your local radio station. This podcast was supported by the Science Granting Council's initiative, which aims to strengthen the institutional capacities of 18 public science funding agencies in sub-Saharan Africa. Africa.